Oh 
trusted Jesus Christ for your salvation. Uh, the way that it's going to work, as most of you know, these two sections over here, you're going to come up your center aisle, take a piece of bread and a cup, and then return back to your seats by the outside aisles. And these two sections here, you'll come up by your center aisle. You'll be served in the front, take a piece of bread and a cup, and return back to your seats by the outside aisles. Here. Just follow the crowd if you don't know. Okay. Um, so if the guys that are serving uh, want to come forward once they're in place, then you can start to come forward to receive them.
He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Jesus, Jesus stood in for us. He was bruised for us. He was beaten for us. He was chast chastened for our peace. This piece of bread, it reminds us that, that God loved us so much that he left heaven and he came down and he took on human flesh and he became a man and he dwelt among us to offer himself as a sacrifice for us for what we've done. Lord, we thank you that you did that. We thank you that you came down. We thank you that you offered yourself as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Lord. You were bruised and you were beaten. You were despised and you were rejected by men, Lord, for us, standing in our place. Lord, you were forsaken by the Father so that we don't have to be forsaken. You did it to reconcile us to God. Thank you for it. Let's eat together. Lord, this cup, it reminds us of your shed blood that you willingly shed for us, that you spilled for us on the cross. Lord, you, offer your, you offered yourself in our place, Lord. You spilled your blood to pay for our sins. We thank you for it, Lord. We thank you that you died to set us free from sin. You died to set us free from the power of the grave. Thank you for the do, do it like you mean it, right? <laughs> Sin and death have been broken by the cross. Amen? All right.
Okay, John chapter 8, let's stand together. We left off in verse 48 last week, um, but I want to back up to verse 39 to get the context for us. So I'm going to begin reading in verse 39 of John chapter 8. <clears throat> they answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me. A man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, we were not born of fornication, implying that Jesus was. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. Now verse 48, where we pick up today. Then the Jews answered and said to him, Do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon. But I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. And I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Then the Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and you say, If anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead, and the prophets who are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? And Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. 
Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. And Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for this passage and the many wonderful truths that you have in this passage, Lord. We ask that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher, that you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to the things you have to say to us today in your word. I pray and ask, Lord, that your spirit would be upon me to teach your word this morning. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So we've, we've been in chapter 8 for a few weeks now, and chapter 8 is a pretty intense chapter. Uh, it's full of conflict between Jesus and the religious leaders of Judaism. In fact, ten times in chapter 8, uh, Jesus was verbally attacked by the religious leaders, or verbally assaulted. And by the end of this conflict, uh, the religious leaders are going to pick up stones and want to kill Jesus. Uh, and so it begins with a verbal assault, and it's going to escalate to a physical assault against Jesus. And the reason the religious leaders were so hostile to Jesus is because he has told them the truth. He has told them the truth. In fact, if we saw as we read through the passage, there were several times where Jesus said, I've told you the truth. I've told you the truth. Jesus told them the truth, and that is what has brought upon their hostility. Jesus told them the truth about themselves. He told them the truth about themselves. You know, the, the Jewish people in this conflict, uh, they believed that they were the spiritual children of Abraham and that Abraham was their spiritual father, not just physical descendants of Abraham as they were, but also spiritual descendants of Abraham. And spiritually speaking, Abraham was their father. They were Abraham's children. They also believed that they were the children of God, the chosen children of God. And the Jewish people kind of prided themselves on being the children of Abraham and the children of God. And what Jesus does in this passage, in this exchange with them, is Jesus tells them the truth. The truth about themselves. He tells them, that they're not children of Abraham. And he tells them that they're not really children of God. That's what they think. That's what they believe about themselves. But Jesus says, you're wrong. You're not. And then Jesus goes on to tell them, and he's just telling them the truth, he goes on to tell them uh, who they really were. In verse 44, he told them they were children of the devil. Now here they think we're children of Abraham, uh, we're, the, we're the promised seed of Abraham, we're children of God, we're chosen children of God, and Jesus says, no, you're wrong, you're not, in fact, you're children of the devil, you're devil children. <laughs> and now why does, why does he say that? He tells us why he said that, because, well first of all, because it was true, he's telling them the truth but also because uh, they were uh, desiring the same things that the devil desires. Uh, the devil, Jesus describes him as a murderer. They wanted to kill Jesus. Uh, Jesus describes the devil as a liar and the father of lies, meaning all lies come from the devil. Uh, they rejected the truth that Jesus told them. They believed the lie. Uh, so their behavior resembles their father, the devil. Now, when someone tells us the truth, when someone tells us the truth about ourselves, uh, we can respond in a variety of different ways. Uh, one way we can respond to the truth about us is with humility, with just humility, uh, and just and receive the truth that has been spoken into our lives with humility, and just say, "Wow, I, I didn't, I didn't realize that. I didn't, I didn't realize that's the way that I am." And we can just kind of humbly receive the truth that's spoken to us. You know, in the Bible it says, Bro a broken and contrite heart, God will never turn away. 
You know, the person who is broken over their sin, who's contrite, who's humble, who's meek when they're confronted with the truth, uh, God receives that person. So that's one way we can respond to the truth, with just humility and receive it. Another way we can respond to the truth is with anger and outrage, with an emotional response. How dare you? How dare you say, I'm a child of the devil? How dare you? I'm a child of God. You know, and we can just be outraged by it. The religious leaders, they respond with anger. And they respond with outrage to the truth. They were so incensed at what Jesus said to them that they responded with verbal insults against Jesus. And then that escalated into a physical assault or an attempt at a physical assault. But they started out with with responding in anger and emotion with a verbal insult. When Jesus said again in verse 44 that your father is actually the devil, you're not children of Abraham like you think, you're not children of God like you think, you're children of the devil because you do what the devil does and you desire what the devil desires. Uh, And in verse 47, Jesus said you're not of God. He's just telling them the truth here. It's just the truth. This is true. The religious leaders responded in verse 48, saying, Do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? They didn't refute what Jesus said. They can't refute it because it's true. They're outraged by it, and so they respond back with a verbal insult, and they call Jesus a Samaritan who has a demon. Now, just so you understand, when they call Jesus a Samaritan, that's a racial slur. Just like a racial slur today. Uh, The the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. Racially, ethnically. Uh, Back in chapter 4, when Jesus goes through Samaria and he speaks with the woman at the well of Sukkar, the very first thing she says is, Why are you, a Jewish man, speaking to me, a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. We don't like each other. Why are you even talking to me? There was a a a racial tension and hatred between these two groups of people. And here, they throw a racial slur at him here, and they call him a Samaritan. You Samaritan. And and to make the insult even worse, they call him a demon-possessed Samaritan. You're not just a Samaritan. You're a demon-possessed Samaritan. And so they just respond here in anger. And notice in verse 48 again, notice how it's worded. It says, do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Or didn't we say all along that you were a Samaritan and demon possessed? This isn't the first time they called Jesus a Samaritan or demon possessed. They've they've said that a lot about him. They've been saying that all along about Jesus. Now this may be the first time they've said it to his face in front of him. But people have been talking this way about Jesus throughout his his ministry. They've called Jesus a demon possessed Samaritan before. Uh, in fact, uh, if you look over in chapter 10 verse 20 Well, verse 19, there is a division among the Jews because of what Jesus was teaching and saying. Verse 20 says, and many of them said, he has a demon and is mad. He's insane. Why do you listen to him? Others said, well, these are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? So they're having this debate. Is he demon possessed or not? Some say he's demon possessed. Some say he's not. Uh, In Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 3 When Jesus cast a demon out of a man, there were those, the religious leaders, who said he cast the demon out by the power of Satan. That he used the power of Satan to cast the demon out. Uh, And so they, they, you know, there are people saying these things about Jesus. Uh, Again, this may be the first time they say it to his face. And I want you to notice here, and I want you to note how Jesus responded to this verbal assault. I mean, they just called him a racial slur. He says demon possessed. And look how he responds to it. He ignored 
the verbal assault. He didn't dignify their racial slur with a response or a reaction. You know, back in chapter 4, when, uh, when he was speaking with the Samaritan woman, she brought up the racial differences. And he just ignored them. Now, when she started talking about worship and where is the right place to worship and the right, place, right, right way to worship God, and then he had something to say about that. But when she's talking about the difference in the races, he, he just ignores it. He doesn't respond to it. He doesn't uh, react to it in any way. He just ignores the racial talk. And here he just ignores what they say, the name. He ignores the insult. You know, in 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, listen to what it says about Jesus. It says, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But instead, he committed himself to him who judges righteously. When Jesus was reviled, he didn't revile in return. When they, when they said, you demon-possessed Samaritan, he didn't say, what would you just say? What would you just call me? You, you want to step outside the temple? And I'll show you what kind of demon-possessed Samaritan I am, you know, kind of thing. He didn't revile back. He didn't threaten. When he suffered at the hands of other people, he didn't threaten them back. He just didn't respond to it. He just didn't respond to any kind of insult that was thrown at him. In verse 49, now watch what happens here. Jesus says, I don't have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Jesus says, I, I honor the Father. I honor God. A demon-possessed person does not honor God. Uh, when the religious leaders um, said that Jesus cast out a demon by the power of Satan in Mark chapter 3 that I referenced just a moment ago, Jesus responded by basically saying, well, that's illogical. That's self-defeating. Satan wouldn't cast out demons. Satan wants to possess people. He wouldn't cast demons out of people. That's when he said, a house divided against itself can't stand. You know, Satan wouldn't fight against himself. It just, it's illogical and self-defeating for Satan to do that. And he makes a similar point here in verse 49 when he says, I honor God. A demon would not honor God. Then he says, you dishonor me. Now, turn with me back to chapter 5, verse 23. You dishonor me. Back in chapter 5, verse 23, Jesus said, All should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. If you dishonor the Son, you dishonor the Father. By dishonoring Jesus, they were dishonoring God. It's impossible to honor God without honoring Jesus Christ. Here in, back in chapter 8, he says, you dishonor me. And then look what he says in verse 15. Watch where he goes now in this conversation. And I do not seek my own glory, but there is one who seeks and judges. So Jesus says here, I do not seek my own glory. When Jesus came down from heaven to the earth and became a man, he did not come seeking his own glory. He did not come for glory. He came uh, in humiliation. Jesus came to this earth in humiliation, not glory. Uh, in Philippians chapter 2, um, I'll just read it to you. You don't have to turn there. But in Philippians chapter 2, if I can find it. Um, Philippians chapter 2. Here it is. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6. Jesus, you know, it says that Jesus is God. He's equal with God. He, you know, he, he had all the glory and all the honor of God in heaven, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, a slave, coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and he became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Crucifixion was the most humiliating way to die, to be stretched out naked on a cross. Jesus, Jesus came in humiliation when he came the first time. He didn't come seeking glory. He came in humiliation. 
And but he says here, he says here. And watch what he says. He says here, uh, I didn't come to glorify myself. I didn't come seeking glory. I came in humiliation. But there is one who seeks to glorify me. And he's the judge. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't seek my own glory. But there is one who seeks to glorify me. That's the Father. The Father will glorify Jesus. Right? That passage in Philippians 2 where it talks about his humility, humbling himself. And that in the rest of that passage, it says that because he humbled himself and died the death of crucifixion, that God the Father will exalt his name above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess him. As Lord, so the Father will glorify the Son, but the Son himself, Jesus, didn't come seeking glory. The religious leaders dishonor Jesus. God the Father will glorify Jesus. And in verse 50, Jesus says, God will glorify me, and this is the important part, he's the judge. He's the judge. You dishonor me, God will glorify me, and God is the judge. God is the judge. Again, he's just telling them the truth here. He's the judge. He will judge you for honoring or dishonoring the Son. There's a judgment. And he's going to judge them for what, how they responded to Jesus Christ, whether they honored Jesus Christ or dishonored Jesus. Jesus Christ. And Jesus is just telling them the truth. This is just the truth. This is just the truth. God's the judge. And he's going to judge you for dishonoring me. That's just the truth. Now watch verse 51. This, oh, this is so amazing. Watch what he does in verse 51. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. You see what Jesus does here now in verse 51. It's, it's remarkable, just remarkable grace that he gives here. He, he tells them, he tells them, you dishonor me. God will honor me. God will glorify me. And God is your judge and God will judge you for dishonoring me. That's the truth. And then in verse 51, you know what he does? He tells them the way to escape God's judgment. Isn't that amazing? He tells them how to escape the judgment that is to come. So he lays out the truth to them. Hey, you're in danger of the judgment because you've dishonored me. But now let me tell you how to escape the judgment. And he does this with who? He's doing this with the people who are saying, well, at least we weren't born of fornication. I mean, your mom is immoral. You're conceived in fornication. These are the people that are calling, you Samaritan, you demon-possessed. They're, they're hurling insults at him, racial slurs. They're angry. They're plotting to kill him. Now, how would you respond to somebody who is angry and shouting insults at you and calling you names, right? And you know that they're under the judgment of God. I mean, how compelled would you feel to tell them a way to escape that judgment, Right? I mean, isn't there a part of you that would kind of stand there and say, well, you're going to get yours. You just watch, right? But not Jesus, not Jesus. As they're, and this is the same conversation. As they're shouting insults at him and angry with him and their emotions are flaring against him, he tells them the truth. Hey, you're, you're in danger of the judgment that is to come, but let me tell you how you can escape that judgment. And look at verse 51 again. He begins verse 51, I love this, by saying most assuredly, and we've talked about that phrase before, might say truly, truly in your Bible, or verily, verily, if you have the old King James. Uh, we've seen that phrase. John, or Jesus uses this phrase 25 times in the Gospel of John, and here, here's what it means. Here's what it means. It means, listen to what I'm about to tell you very carefully. Listen to what I'm about to tell you very carefully. You're in danger of the judgment that is to come, but listen to what I'm about to tell you very carefully because I'm going to tell you how to escape it. You see the grace here? You see the love that Jesus has for these people that are, hate him and are just spewing hate at him? 
Listen very carefully. And I'll tell you how to escape the judgment that is to come. These are people that want to kill him. That are verbally attacking him. They're insulting him. Insulting his mother. Insulting his mother's reputation. Calling him racial slurs. He says it to them. He says it to that crowd. Let me tell you how you can escape. Listen very carefully. And he offers salvation to them. He gives them this invitation now. Now what did Jesus say? If you remember in the Sermon on the Mount. What did he say? How you're to treat your enemies. How you're supposed to. What are you supposed to do with your enemies? Or you're supposed to punch them in the nose, right? You're supposed to knock them out when they're talking to you like this. No, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus in, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. They're cursing Jesus to his face. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Love your enemies. Bless them. Do good to them. I mean, you know, I can, I can think of, of no greater example of love than telling those people who hate you, your enemies, who are cursing you to your face, to tell them how to escape the judgment that is to come. Right? Right? Notice in verse 51 again, notice that Jesus used the word anyone, anyone. That's a very broad invitation that he is extending here. Anyone. Doesn't matter who you are. Anyone who keeps my word shall never. You see that word? I love those two words. Anyone and never. (laughs) Anyone. Who keeps my word shall never see death. What a promise. What a promise. Now what kind of death is he talking about here? He's not talking about physical death. Because Jesus himself will experience physical death on the cross. So he's not talking about physical death. People physically die every day. Jesus is talking about what the Bible calls the second death. In Revelation chapters 20 and 21. The second death is eternal separation from God. It's eternal separation and it's eternal punishment. Uh, it is the lake of fire in Revelation. In Revelation it talks about, and death was cast into the lake of fire, and this is the second death. The lake of fire where the fire is never quenched, where the worm never dies. It's probably the picture you have of hell when you think of hell. That's the lake of fire. You know, the the continual punishment and torment and burning and separation from God. That's what he's talking about here. The person, he says, anyone who keeps my word, he shall never taste death. He'll never experience that second death. For the believer in Jesus Christ, the person who's put their trust in him, when that believer dies, they immediately go into the presence of Jesus Christ. Instantly. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8 says, When we are absent from our body, we are at home with the Lord. I love that. We're at home with Him. Finally home. This world's not our home. This body that you're in is not your permanent home. It's described as a tent. It's temporary. But when a believer dies, when they breathe their last breath, they're immediately in the presence of Jesus Christ. In their home. John chapter 14, verse 3, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. That's your home. Where Jesus is, that's home for the believer in Jesus Christ. Not this world. You know, in John chapter 11, Jesus said in John chapter 11, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he asks the all-important question. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Yes, they'll experience physical death. The body will give out. But then we immediately go into the presence of Jesus Christ. We immediately go into eternal life. And here in John chapter 8, Jesus offers this crowd that is you know, angry at him and hating him and shouting insults at him. He offers them eternal life. He gives this invitation to anyone 
who receives it. And he tells them the truth. And he says to them, you're going to be judged by God. But if you believe in me and you keep my word, you will escape the judgment and you will have eternal life. If you don't, you will be judged. You'll be cast into the lake of fire. You'll experience eternal separation from God and eternal torment. Once again, he's just simply giving them the truth. This is the truth. This is what happens. This is the choice that he lays out for them. Believe in Jesus Christ, escape judgment, receive eternal life. Don't believe, experience the judgment of God and the lake of fire and the second death. It's, it's just, he just lays it out plain for them. 1 John chapter 5, uh, verses 11 and 12, he says, uh, He who has the Son has life, he who does not have the Son does not have life. It's real plain, real straightforward. If you have the Son, you have life. If you don't have the Son, you don't have life. And so now he lays this truth out for this crowd, and now the crowd has a choice. They have a choice to make. The truth has been presented. What do we do with the truth? Well, look how the crowd responded to the truth in verse 52. Then the Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead. And the prophets, and you say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead, and the prophets who are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? The crowd says, now we know you have a demon. Now we know you're crazy. You're crazy. You're insane. And why do they say that? Because he's claiming here to have the power over judgment and the power over death. And only God has the power over death. That's why they say to him, why, who do you make yourself out to be? Are you claiming to be God? Because it sure sounds like you're claiming to be God, you nutcase. How do you respond to the truth of Jesus Christ? What do you do with it? Well, they think Jesus is crazy. Demon possessed. So Jesus says in verse 54, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God, Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Now look at verse 56. Your father Abraham, remember they thought they were children of Abraham. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and he was glad. Huh. They already think he's crazy. And he don't care, you know. <laughs> And so he just says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and, and he was glad. Why don't you join your father Abraham? You say that you're sons of Abraham, you're children of Abraham. Why don't, why don't you share in the joy that Abraham enjoyed? Now, how did Abraham see Jesus' day? How did Abraham see Jesus' life and ministry? Abraham lived 2,000 years before Christ. So how did he see it? Well, in, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13, it says that Abraham could see the things promised afar off. That God gave Abraham some kind of perception to see the ministry of Jesus Christ from afar, from his day, that he could, he could look ahead prophetically and see the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. We don't know exactly how, because it doesn't tell us, but uh, it, perhaps Abraham could see uh, the miraculous birth of the Messiah in the miraculous birth of his own son, Isaac. Because you remember from last week, Abraham was 100 years old, Sarah was 90 years old. Their bodies were dead, unable to have a baby, make a baby. And God gave them a son, miraculously, Isaac. They named him Isaac, which means laughter. Why? Abraham laughed and Sarah laughed when God said, you're going to have a baby. Because they knew how impossible it was. So maybe in the miraculous birth of his own son, Isaac, the Lord allowed him to see down to when the Messiah would be born to a virgin. The miraculous birth of the Messiah. Maybe... Abraham saw the priesthood of Jesus Christ when he encountered the priest Melchizedek 
in Genesis chapter 14, who was the priest of Salem or Jerusalem. Remember, Abraham tithed to him. Why would he tithe to a priest? And Melchizedek, the priest, he brought wine and bread to Abraham, and they shared wine and bread together, communion together. Tells us in uh, the Psalm, Psalm 110, that Melchizedek had no beginning and he had no end. He's eternal. And it says in Hebrews that Jesus was a priest according to the order of Melchizedek, in the line of Melchizedek. Maybe Abraham, when he encountered Melchizedek, maybe he could see Jesus Christ, the priesthood of Christ in that. Maybe when uh, Abraham took his son Isaac, who was about 30 years old at the time, and took him up Mount Moriah to offer him to God as a sacrifice. Maybe in that, God allowed Abraham to see the sacrifice that his son, Jesus Christ, would make on the same mountain, on Calvary, for the sins of the world. Maybe somehow Abraham could see that. Remember, as they go up the mountain, Isaac, his adult son, says to his father, Father, we've got the wood, we've got the fire. Where is the lamb for the sacrifice? Remember what Abraham said? God will provide himself a lamb. God will provide himself as the lamb for sacrifice. That, by the way, in the Old Testament, that's the first time you see the word lamb mentioned. When Abraham is talking about God providing himself as a lamb for sacrifice. In the New Testament, the first time you see the word lamb is when John the Baptist points at Jesus and says, Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Father, where's the sacrifice? God will provide himself a lamb. Behold the lamb of God. And maybe Abraham was able to see this somehow. Uh, when Abraham sent his servant to go find a bride for his son, Isaac. Maybe Abraham could see in that how God would send the Holy Spirit into the world to find a bride, the church, for his son, Jesus Christ. Abraham could see it. Jesus says Abraham could see it. He could see his day. And he rejoiced. He was glad. So verse 57, Then the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? How do you know what made Abraham glad? How do you know what Abraham rejoiced about? You've never met him. You're not even 50 years old. Then Jesus said to them, verse 58, Most assuredly, again, there's that word. Listen to me. What I'm about to say to you is very important. Don't miss what I'm about to say. Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was... I am. Oh, yeah, again, we've talked about that in recent weeks. I am is the Old Testament covenant name for God. In Exodus chapter 3, you know, God is eternal. He's the eternal one. And because he's eternal, he's not I was or I will be. He is I am. He always is. He's the great I am. And, and Jesus now uses that same name and applies it to himself. And he says that, he is, I am. Jesus is clearly claiming to be God here in verse 58. You know, Jesus is not just a man. He's not a prophet. He is God. He's God incarnate. He's God in the flesh. He's Emmanuel. He's God with us. He's the I am of the Old Testament. That's why he can talk about Abraham as if he met Abraham, because he did. That's why he can talk about uh, having power over sin and power over death and life and power over judgment, the power to forgive because he's God. He's not just a man, he's God. And he's clearly, clearly claiming that in verse 58. So much so, the crowd understood exactly what he was saying here. In verse 59, they pick up stones to throw at him, to kill him for blasphemy. But it says Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them. And so he passed by. Jesus has presented the truth to this crowd all along. And he's told them, I've just told you the truth. I've just told you the truth. I've just told you the truth. He's presented the truth to them. He's told them that they are in danger of God's judgment 
for judging him or for dishonoring him. And he told them the way to escape that judgment is by, is by putting their faith and trust in him and believing in him. And he's given them this invitation to believe in him and be saved from the judgment that is to come and to receive eternal life. And he gave them this choice now. He's just laid it out. He's, he's declared that he is God. He's the I am. It's just the truth. Here's just the truth for you. And they have a choice what they do with the, with the truth. And they choose to pick up stones and kill him. And so what does Jesus do? He walks away. What else can he do? He's told them the truth. He's told them everything. And they don't receive it. You know, you got no one to hold him, you got no one to fold him, you got no one to walk away. He's laid it all out. He's laid out the truth. They've rejected the truth. And so he just walks away. Because there's nothing more to say. And to me, uh, this is the scariest part of the passage. That Jesus will present the truth, and he presents it clearly and just lays it out. And if a person rejects it, he leaves. Do you remember, remember when Jesus crosses the Sea of Galilee and he goes to the other side with the disciples? They come through the storm, they go to the other side, they come to the other side, and they're encounter, they encounter a demon-possessed man in Gadara. Remember that? And Jesus casts the demons out. He's got a legion of demons in him. Jesus casts the demons out into a herd of swine. Swine run down the hill into the Sea of Galilee and drown, right? And, um, and then the, the, the swine shepherds, or whatever you'd call them, I don't know what you call them, uh, they go back to town, they go back to the city, they tell the people in the city what's happened. The people in the city, they come out. Remember, Remember what they, they said, said to Jesus? Jesus? Leave. You're, You're messing, messing with, with our pigs. pigs. We, we want, want our pigs, pigs more than we want you. Lee. And, and, and here's the scariest, scariest part of that whole passage. You know what Jesus did? He got in the boat and he left. He didn't plead with them. No, no, you don't understand. I'm Jesus. I'm the Savior. No. I just got in the boat and left. And here, he's laid out the truth for them. He's laid it all out. There was nothing more for Jesus to do or say at this point, the only thing for Jesus to do, walk away. And that's what he did. And Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for all the truth that you lay out in this chapter. We thank you that um, you give us an invitation to anyone to believe in you and trust in you, to receive eternal life, to escape judgment. Thank you that you're, you're God incarnate, that you're God come down from heaven. Thank you that you sacrificed yourself in our place. You took our punishment to make a way for us to have eternal life, to make a way for us to escape judgment. Lord, we thank you for just laying it out for us, laying out the truth. And Lord, I, I pray for all of us here, Lord, that we would choose to receive you. Those that are here, Lord, that haven't, they would because you've made it plain for us Lord. thank you Lord that you love us enough to tell us the truth about ourselves the truth about our future and uh, Lord we thank you that you love us enough to make a way of escape for us and we pray these things in Jesus name Amen. Let's stand together. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me.
service, there'll be men and women down front available to pray with you. Uh, if you're here today, you've never trusted Christ, and you've had the truth laid out before you today. And you've got one of two options. You know, you can put your faith in Jesus Christ and escape the judgment of God and receive eternal life, or not, and you're under the judgment of God, and you'll be eternally separated from Him in the lake of fire in the second death. And so, you know, you've got door number one, you've got door number two. And it's that plain, and the choice is that, that clear. So if you've never accepted Christ, you've never put your faith in, you've never really taken that step, if you've gone to church a long time, you really have never done that. Uh, as we close out the service, there'll be men and women down front. Just come down front and ask me to pray with you before you. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you this week. May he be gracious to you and give you peace in Jesus' name.